and hello. Hi everybody. Um, so there's something, uh, this is probably going to be the last uh, part of the Unreal tourism streaming that I'm doing, in which I play through the original Unreal, released in 1998, and uh, play it with a mod that I created that removes all of the enemies from the game, thus removing any kind of combat, so that you can just kind of treat it like an exploration game. Um, there's something, just in case, I don't know who all is in the chat right now, but uh, just in case somebody from Epic ever sees this on YouTube or something, um, I do think I want to make a case. I want to use I want to use this last little chapter, this last little part of this series here as a soapbox. I think that there is historical value in releasing the source, the full source code for Unreal Engine One, just because uh, at this point, obviously, the game has you know kind of done most of the business that it's going to, and also I think I hope Epic and other publishers who have maybe been cool on open source releases of their engine code before, know when you release the source code for something, you're not giving up any rights to sell stuff. Like, id released the source code for Doom and Quake, and those games still sell. They are available on Steam and all that. You're really just giving people the right to make their own version of the executable and modify it and stuff like that. Uh, and given that this is such old technology, I think it's m it mostly has historical value. And in situations like that, like from the perspective of preservation and a, just as a game designer who wants cool things to be preserved and also to be able to learn from them and kind of poke around with them and, you know, maybe a, maybe a small mod community as well. I think that kind of stuff um, is a really, I think that kind of stuff is really good to have out in effectively the public domain or, or under an open source, under a permissive open source release. Um, and specifically, like, I hope some of the things that I've highlighted here in my series on this game, uh, I think this game is still interesting and kind of vibrant and has something to teach us even, like, however many years, like, 17 or so years later. Uh, and I think that's really cool. Um, it's not, you know, a lot of games don't necessarily hold up as well. Um, and I've talked about some of the unique visual things that the game does and just how, you know, um, yeah, the game was doing some interesting things. And I think that's worth preserving over and above just continuing to offer the game for sale. Um, I think uh, so there's like learning value and preservation value. I think also it just helps make sure that your games stay future proof. At some point, you know, like an, some version of Windows will come out that breaks compatibility with old stuff. And I don't know, maybe some other operating system will gain a bunch of market share. And in situations like that, uh, like, you know, I can understand that it doesn't necessarily make the business sense to pay somebody in house to port it. Whereas when you have your code out, then, you know, the community that coalesces around your source code is going to keep the game running on modern systems just because, you know, people are, are into that. So anyway, um, I, the, the site that I've got open in my web browser here is uh, oldunreal.com. So I think Epic has actually made the source available to individuals on a private, possibly NDA'd basis. Uh, and that is, the, that is the reason that I have been able to do this series playing the game in high in high de you know in 1080p and on Linux you know without any technical problems or anything so that's really cool like epic has already kind of gone halfway with this and you know people are people have made a patch with the cooperation of epic and that's awesome uh, but I think like and particularly because they've you know if they've gone this far uh, I do think it would be nice if they like kind of went the rest of the way um, and just released the source. Now, I can imagine any number of reasons that that wouldn't make sense necessarily. Like maybe there's like some legalities r involving code used in the original source code. Maybe there's rights that are held externally or something. So anyway, um, whoops, there goes my, sorry. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to, to, to do my spiel. I asked, I actually asked them, I dug this up on Twitter. I guess it was about, a, it was a year and change ago that I asked uh, Epic on Twitter, please consider open sourcing Unreal Engine 1, circa 436. That was kind of the last like publicly released version of that. 
Um, and Epic said, we'll bring this up with folks here. Thank you for the suggestion. So thank you very much for just listening to that suggestion on Twitter. I don't know how much discussion internally that generated. But uh, yeah, uh, consider that. It's an, it's, it would be a good way to make sure that your games survive into the coming decades and people can continue to play it and that it will get the historical you know, uh, benefit that, it, that, it, that I think it deserves. So with that said, let me just jump in to the last bit of the game here. And if y'all haven't seen this series before, I've been playing through this game with a mod that removes all combat. Uh, and it's kind of turned into this just because I guess I just compulsively do this when I play a game because I'm, I'm a, you know, I was a professional level designer and and game developer for many years and now I'm independent. Um, but it's kind of just turned into a big uh, level design critique kind of thing where I talk about all the stuff that the game is doing uh, and all that. So anyway, um, yeah, let's jump in. It's a really cool fly through. I just enjoy this every time. This is the Return to Napali expansion. It was developed by Legend Entertainment about a year after uh, the original game came out. So, when we last left off, we had just blown up the reactor core thingy, and it had made this, it had caused this gigantic explosion that left this kind of nuclear blast type sphere out of the ground and big spectacular thing. And now we're going to go into we're going to go back into the level that we had been navigating. But now all of the lights are going to be out. And so it, that means it's going to be spooky time. And yeah, there's already some spooky mood lighting and such. A little compartment has opened up here, and this thing is, yeah, this is like a searchlight, which uh, is like a flash, is very much like a flashlight, but it has way better, yeah, but it has way better uh, battery life, so to speak. So, yeah, um, and yeah, we're seeing these familiar locations. And yeah, I guess there's this little fog ball type thing right here. Um, this was a separate level load, so I think, you know, clearly they just kind of like locked down the geometry for this level and then, um, you know, and then just kind of copied the file and, and uh, you know, and then just deleted all the lights and probably did a bunch of other tweaks. You've got a classic sparking wire kind of thing here. I forget if I can go here. Okay, so the elevators still work. I guess important stuff like doors and elevators still runs on emergency power. Uh, I am uh, checking up on the chat here. There was something. Um, tonic Tonician or Tonic Ian or however you pronounce their name. Uh, when asked about this on a live stream once, they mentioned that Unreal 1 was a candidate for source release because it didn't have any corporate partners involved that contributed code. Ah, yes, okay. Well, that's good to hear. I, I hope that does happen. Um, the other, like, you know, the other reason that I forgot to mention earlier uh, that an Unreal 1 source release would be very good and important uh, is because um, there are some other, you know, just as historically significant games. Uh, the one I'm thinking of specifically is Deus Ex, is the first Deus Ex, which used Unreal Engine 1. And uh, IDOS, obviously, like, well, Square Enix, I guess now, um, owns um, owns the rights to that, to that game. Oh no, there's combat music. Um, but yeah, I think Deus Ex is especially important. It's still regarded as this classic game that is, you know, one of the best games of its kind uh, ever created, and people love it and all that, and uh, right now, I mean, there's multiple things preventing a preventing a source release or any kind of preservation effort for that game, but the engine being open source would definitely knock down one of those uh, barriers, and I think that's important. Also, a game that I worked on at Human Head Studios, uh, well, I worked on an expansion to Rune Halls of Valhalla, um, and that's another cool, you know, it's like a Viking hack and slash game. Used Unreal Engine 1. Um, yeah, it was used for a bunch of games, actually. Alright. I'm already kind of... Alright, so I took this elevator up. What was their 
point in. Oh yeah, these these were those uh, these were the jail cells that were previously filled with jerks, and now they've gotten out. Um, oh yeah, and there's a there's a dead yeah there's a dead there's a pre-placed scourge corpse, sort of showing that they had killed their jailer. And yeah. It's always a classic thing when you see something in captivity and then you're you're like, oh I'm glad I can't I'm glad it can't come after me. And it does. And yeah, this is um with the enemies, this this be this does become an especially spooky level, which is uh which is cool. It's a nice they're kind of priming you for the final boss fight. I think this this it's a good pacing decision. Ow. Okay, so yeah, now we're in these kind of some of these sort of identical ish kind of rooms. There's creepy noises, and I think those are the like the cyborg mercenary enemy dudes that are uh what? Um, you know, they're just in the dark and chilling. And, yeah, we can go in here. This was this area that we saw, like, getting gated off by the electrical field or some such before. And I forget if there's anything meaningful down here. No. Well, we can tell that there's combat because they scripted the combat music on, but... And then it fades back out. Because we're all about chilling out here. In Unreal 1 tourism land. Alright, so the, the green, the mysterious green goo is still around. Oh ho, here we go. Alright, so this is taking us up to the higher level. Yeah, those are some of the, uh, some of those cryopod like dealies that, um, saw earlier, but they were closed, and I think Scarge Elites or something, like those guys with the shield belts, are coming out, would be coming out of them normally. Um, I forget what we're supposed to do here. Oh, okay, yeah, right, that raised up some stairs here, that's cool. Kind of opened a shortcut -y way. Cool, some sort of uh, weird, you know... Oh, that's like a lens. That's a lens flare with a fire texture on it. So that's cool that their uh, lens flare code, you know, worked with fire textures. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't, but uh, that's super neat. See, so yeah, I think we do something with this thingamajig. Authorization granted. Activate the emergency power supply. So what do I... Uh, what exactly do I do here? Gotta activate it. The source antechamber. Access denied. Oh! Oh! Oh, okay. Alright, so that thingy... Just kind of get close to it and it activates. And there's like a cool lightning bolt. There's totally a, a Resonance Cascade scenario is absolutely about to happen here, which is pretty cool. And now I think we can go to the source. The source antechamber, sorry. We are not yet at the source. Um, cool, there's all kinds of just spooky business going on here. Hit a switch. the more interestingly textured. Yeah. Cool. Cool gate coming open. Yeah, we're definitely building up to something. You know, you can kind of feel the grandeur kicking up here. Um, yeah, th this area is one of the more successful executions of the, sc with, of the Scarge, like, texture, the architecture style here, you know? Like, they've got this sort of piping texture that got some little subtracts sitting in here with. Like, this looks pretty cool. I like it. 
and now there's like an energy bridge that we go over. Oh yeah, and then we get into this, which is just another awesome like demo scene tunnel fly through. Which I super love. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's time. Alright. It's time for the last level of this video game. We're seeing good old Unreal purple and green tinged lighting. I love it. Now we come out, and there's a big, huge thing here. There's like this sort of creepy, Giger-esque alien texture here, and a big old thing with green beams going into it or something. So we're definitely getting the sense that the final boss of the game is in here. I forget what's... Yeah, like, what's this all about? Yeah, I guess there's just like some ammo here. Uh, sorry, some armor here. It's just... The armor itself is a little underwhelming. Given the grandiosity of how they're giving it to you. Yep, and they're giving you all this armor, this ammo, you know. And yeah, we know that it is... Uh, it is for sure butt-kicking time. Um, this door here is going to iris open. Oh, and it's got this creepy alien texture on it. We're definitely going into creepy alien times. And we've just picked up the super jump boots. Which we can use to jump all over the place. Alright, so obviously we're in tourism mode, so we walked in and the boss died immediately. Um, and I forget what... Uh, I think they're supposed to... Yeah, yeah, see? Yeah, the, pl the base has started self-destructing. So we don't have a lot of time to ignore this, to admire the scenery here, but, you know, we can see that there's cool goo tubes and such. And they gave us jump boots, and so we could be all jumping around and shooting rockets, but we don't really need to do any of that. I'm assuming that this slow opening door is just for dramatic effect. And yes, this whole mothership is just blowing up. And there's, there's, th that is our escape craft. And yeah. And that's the world we've been on. That's the world that we've been exploring. I like that they gave us a look at it at this late point in the game sort of a parting gesture. And then we go here. And then it cuts outside of us into third person, basically. Uh, and we're on this escape ship. Just this little Scarge shuttle thingy. And the mothership's blowing down all around us. We're getting another sweet tunnel fly through. This is perhaps the sweetest tunnel fly through, I think. Just all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah, look at that! Just... I love the way the sounds Doppler by, you know, like that's super rad. Yeah. Yeah. And there it goes. And yeah, I guess we made it into space. Yeah, yeah. We're coming through the cloud cover there. Mm-hmm. But now we are marooned in space. Our little escape pod. The Scarge escape pod has broken free from the planet's gravitational pull, barely. Yet its, full has yet its fuel has depleted, and you drift aimlessly. From where many have died, you have escaped. You laugh to yourself. So much has happened, but little has changed. Oh, I guess because you're in prison. You're still trapped. In pr whatever, you know. You started off in a prison ship. Before the, okay, they're going to spell it out for us here. Before the crash landing, you were trapped in a cramped cell. Now, once again, you are confined in a prison. Ah, yes. You're calling that. Just right on the dotted line there. But yeah, we're getting like a cool space vista here, and like that's one of the moons that we saw. But you feel confident that someone will come upon your small vessel eventually. And we get an answer for that in the Return to Napali expansion, where, you know, you return to the planet, and you're given a voice. Like, your protagonist has, an, has I think, maybe a name, as well as a voice. Um, until then, you drift in hope. And then that's the, that's the credits, I guess. Actually, I don't think they roll the credits. 
They do that cool thing, like, I don't know if you saw this, that text, um, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the course of this playthrough, but, um, Unreal 1 specifically had this cool feature where it would just print the name of the level and the level designer on the, like, when you would walk in, in white text in the center top of the screen. Um, and I always liked that. It was kind of a way of, like, honoring, you know, just how they had, yeah, I don't know, yeah, like, it, it, it's cool to show the level designer's name. I, I don't know, that, that that's obviously me, obviously me speaking from ego as a, as a level designer, but, uh, you know, it made me more aware of who had made the game, and that was, that was cool. So yeah, yeah, we're getting yet we're getting one final. I think this is Alex Brandon. Uh, if it's not, it's it's one of the other cool composers who worked on the who composed music for this game. Getting one last sweet tracker tune before before we we end this video game. But yeah, and then some kind of a you know that's kind of a uncertain melancholy note. Um, in the expansion, I'll spoil that much for you. Like, you come back to Napali and, well, it's called Return to Napali, so yes. You get rescued, and then you have to go, but you have to go back for some reason. And it's a whole different thing, and it, it has a f somewhat level different level design sensibility. I mean, it's obviously still Scarge and all that, and they made a bunch of unique textures and a few different enemies and different weapons and stuff. So it's just kind of a classic 90s expansion, game expansion pack. Um, it's not bad. I've only played it, like, once or once probably um so i don't i just it's just not nearly as on the brain um i guess at some point i should play through it just to see if my tourism mod works with it uh i think it probably does but um anyway uh that's about all i got to say i mean yeah like again yeah i think a, a source release for unreal engine one would have real historical value so they should do that i hope somebody uh i hope some game developer makes uh, makes another game that is is eclectic thematically as this game where you have like temples and castles and factories and spaceships and you know just that whole and then outdoor areas and that whole mix of stuff because um, an earlier rant that I had in, in part three or something like that uh, was like yeah because I, I, I think the sort of eclecticism of this game is definitely one of its strengths I mean it results in things being just a weird you know salad of ideas sometimes, but um, I don't know. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, and yeah, like lastly, I guess, yeah, thank you for watching me play through this game in sort of a weird way. Like, it's kind of not as exciting as watching someone play a first-person shooter game where they're, you know, getting all the sweet headshots and stuff, but I like... I kind of like the idea that you can change something small about a game and playing it changes it completely. You know, it changes your mindset as a player, and it kind of changes what things in the game mean. And I think uh, playing games in really different ways. Rob Yang just put up something on his blog about this. I think playing games in different, in a different way, uh, is kind of a is kind of an interesting artist artistically expressive act. You know, um, and there's maybe some interesting expressions to be found in old games that we think we know well um, that go beyond. You know, some much more established forms of expressive play, which would be like speed runs, and uh, you know, and whatever do whatever runs. You know. So anyway, I guess this was a no combat run of Unreal, and thank you very much for watching and for providing consistently awesome thoughts and feedback and stuff in the chat. Uh, it's been cool sharing this game with you and taking a trip down memory lane and seeing if there's something interesting in this old game that I've played a few times now. But yeah. Let me, um... Let me check the chat here just to field anything. Um... Yes, uh... Someone asks, did you ever play Unreal 2? I did play Unreal 2. Uh, yes, a, uh, a good friend of mine worked on Unreal 2 back at Legend. And so, yeah, I wanted to make sure I played it, you know, soon after it came out and, you know, support that studio and all that. Uh, they ended up you know, getting killed off by Atari, their their publisher, uh, Infogrames, uh, within within a year or so. But yeah, Unreal, Unreal 2 was interesting. I, I only played it the once. Um, it was much more story-based. It was much more... It had a lot more conceptual... Conce things that were common for games in 2003. Like, it had cutscenes and voice acting and a big story and all this kind of stuff. So it was sort of... It was really of a different era. I mean, like... Yeah, like, it's kind of amazing how much things changed. I mean, I guess it only came out about five years-ish after 
after uh, Unreal 1, but uh, it's it's a product of a very different era. Um, and yeah, I remember it having like some cool set piece moments and some cool visuals and some cool bits of level design. You know, I, I know some, some some strong level designers worked on it and good art. And you know, it was also like kind of a flagship for the un, for Unreal Engine 2, the the new hotness. Um, so it showed off that stuff. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't think about that game nearly as much just because it is so much more conventional in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for joining me. Uh, make games if you can with more weird with a mix of weird stuff in it. Like it's kind of harder because you're stretching yourself w more. But uh, make games that do all their storytelling with text if you can figure out a cool way to, because I think that's valuable. Like, the value that a good voice actor brings is really tremendous, but, you know, just really light touch text-based storytelling that you uncover in the environment as part of an exploration type sense, I think works really well together. And I think people can, you know, you could still do really good things with that in the modern day. Anyway, I'll stop blabbing about stuff. Thank you again for joining me and watching me play through this game. And yeah, I don't know if I'll do this again for different games, for another game. Uh, I don't know. Sugge suggestions on Twitter or something would be most welcome. If there's a game that you would like to watch me play with no enemies, just kind of wander around and take in the, the level design, uh, let me hear it. All right. Oh, cool. Okay, yeah, we get the credits when we uh, when we uh, go to quit. Yeah, talented people. Good job. All right, and I.